it's only been a few hours. Yep, but it's uh, 23 hours, 14 minutes into the day of Friday, December 6th. And it's time for the uh, weekend BTS vlog. BTS vlog brings you a behind the scenes uh, uh, look at uh, a real research desk. It brings you uh, into my life. This is a, basically uh, it's the segment of the uh, Big Bang Theory RRL that brings you uh, all the day-to-day -day bits. It's not the research notes, but some of the stuff that, that does go into the research notes, you'll see here uh, as we work on it bit by bit. Research notes take a little bit more time. That's Those are the Insta vlogs. Take a little bit more time to put together. Uh, so they're not out as frequently. But uh, here, we're basically at the research desk day in, day out. That's, that's where I am here. And uh, that's kind of what you see. And I've been sort of going back over and thinking about this, is that th this is not the first research test that I have. Uh, it's basically, this is the third I've had in just about, uh, third or fourth desk, that a research test that I've had in about, uh, about 12 years. So, basically, I've been here at this, unit, li this location for about 12 years, a little bit more than 12 years. And in 12 years, just about every three years, every four years, there about there's a new research desk and involves basically the, the because we operate twenty operate twenty four seven here. Uh, this the research goes on twenty four seven, never shuts down. There's no real break to this. Uh, you can't shut a desk down from its operations. So when one desk, you, let's say you want to improve or upgrade the desk to a point where you have to bring in really new equipment, you don't shut the desk down. What you do is you move it. And so while you set up and, and create the new desk, the old desk is operating. When the new desk comes into full operations and you, you move over to the, front, the, to the new research desk and the old, uh, uh, old research desk, you now have to clean up the old uh, research desk and start taking it down and either repurpose the room or, uh, you know, do something with it. But, and again, that, that takes time. And as you start taking down the uh, the old uh, research desk, you realize that at some point in time you're going to need a new research desk. So you start working uh, on your current research desk, trying to push it as far as you can. But you also keep in mind that you're going to need a second, and uh, you're eventually going to move to another research desk. And you begin trying to repurpose space, readjust space, so that uh, you can do that as well. And that leads to a lot of the chaos that you see behind me uh, with stuff all over the place because rooms are always being purposed and then repurposed depending on what I think is going to be happening two to three years down the road. Uh, but also at the same time dealing with that I've now got one, this new research that's done. Those other two rooms that I had before, I had one in the back room, one in the front room there. Those were uh, all old research desks. They are all now being cleaned up and repurposed. Uh, the kitchen diner was an old, older kitchen uh, before then. It was sort of a, a bits and pieces of stuff. But I decided to repurpose that and, and create something brand new with it. So that became a new thing as well. And so there's a lot of cleaning up and going on, uh, cleaning up and uh, reorganizing in there. And the same thing with the front room. All the different areas in here. Uh, because they have to be multi, multi, multi-purpose, they can't be for one thing. Are always in a state, a state of state of change, a state of flux, and so things are always all over the place. Because no project is ever completed on one day or another. It, they, they they complete the projects, one project or parts of a project are broken up into sub project and these projects are, are done on a bit by bit basis. As one product cleans up, another project begins, and so. Different things take different places, and this is kind of the way things go. And way that we're kind of where, what I'm used to uh, being done on a daily basis. And now you're going to start seeing this on a more regular basis because I'm going to bring this into the BTS vlogs. You're going to start seeing more and more now the day-to-day -day operations that goes on here. Anyways, this is it for the opening uh, segment. I'll be back in a little bit with the next uh, sub segment. Well. Even though this is not is not supposed to be, this is the opening segment of the weekend BTS vlog. So let's go with our uh, date and timestamp. 
it is uh, basically um, 39 minutes into the day of Monday, December 9th. That's right. Uh, the entire weekend is gone. Uh, I have no idea where it went. Uh, but nonetheless, it is gone. And uh, we are now, uh, said we are 39 minutes into uh, December uh, 9th. Yeah, Monday, December 9th, 2013. Uh, that, 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 that happens sometimes. When you get bogged down uh, doing research, and I'm at my research desk, I, I, I spend a large chunk of my time at the research desk. When you get bogged down like this, time just literally disappears. You forget what time it is. You lose track of time. And by the time you get up and you finish whatever you set out to do, uh, then... Uh, the when you catch up with what time it is, you're surprised at actually how much t time you've spent. I started working on a small project. Uh, I think sometime yesterday, on uh, sometime on Saturday or Sunday, can't remember exactly when it was. No, that's what it was. I, I was finishing one project uh, on Saturday. I was finishing a project. Of, I started on Friday, Thursday, Friday. I started a project, uh, a research project, uh, and then finished it up around Saturday, and then decided to do something a little bit more uh, to sort of see how things go. In other words, this is going to be, and this is, this is what I'm working on now, uh, a new direction of research. Uh, it's not necessarily, not necessarily a new direction, but. Uh, it's something I need to add into my research to eventually uh, fill in some of the holes, some of the gaps that I have, uh, particularly with the Greek research. Uh, and so I began that, and I did. It, it begins the way it mostly where the way it mostly begins. You have no idea what you're looking for, so you cast a very wide net in terms of what you're going out and looking for. In other words, you go out, you randomly find what you're looking, you randomly find stuff, you pick it up. You analyze it, you see what it is, and then as you start picking up more and more stuff uh, and seeing what's what, you get a sense of feeling, okay, well, let me just try over here, and then let me try over here. In other words, you try different avenues, quite randomly, actually. Uh, and then at some point in time, it starts to narrow down, and you start to have a better idea of where you might be going or what you might like to see, and so on and so forth, and that kind of... Uh, drives where you go next, and then this this is sort of what I when I when people may ask a question about well what is open exploration? Open exploration is that it has no direction; it's literally unrestricted. Typically, uh, in the classical sciences, in business, business the sciences that most people know of, the taught in schools. Uh, all experimentation and exploration has a particular purpose. And you have to know this purpose before you head on out. But if you're really going into exploration and you're going into the unknown, there's no way to do that. There's no way, uh, if you're going into the unknown, to have some preconceived idea of what you're going to find. Because it's unknown. That's why you're going... And the, thing is, the reason why you're going into the unknown is to figure out what it is. And I think if you have some preconceived idea... Uh, some prejudice as to what it is, some perception as to what you're going to find, then you're going to ruin the experience because you're not going to be open, your mind is not going to be open to the things that you see. In other words, you have to get around your own ego, you have to put it aside if you want to do open exploration. If you want to be the quintessential professor where you know the smoke and the pipe and the tweed jacket and have the prestige and the esteem of the esteemed professor, well, you're not going to be able to do open exploration because that attitude, the mindset that gives you the esteem, that that makes you want the prestige, uh, destroys the capacity to go out and explore. Because open go, going out to explore means you have to have an open mind. You have to put your own ego aside. You have to put your own prestige aside, and you're simply the observer. If you're going to get into this mindset, into this frame set, it's hard every time you do. Every time you go out and do something new, every time you add a new bit of research, and it is a little difficult because you're really not too sure exactly what you're doing. 
And it is a bit of, in the beginning, it's, you're basically feeling around. You don't know exactly where you're going. And there's a lot of trial and error. And you can never claim to be an expert. You're simply there in that environment trying out different things, seeing what works best for you in your exploration. And I think and one, one explore, exploration technique that works for me may not work for another, another explorer or, or, or somebody else. It, 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 how things work for me is specific to me and my understanding. Of things and how I understand things. So, this is kind of what's been going on, and uh, I've been also doing some cleaning up work, work on the kitchen diner. That goes without saying. I will do more of an introduction to, to the kitchen diner later, not now, because I still have a lot of cleaning to do before it's uh, camera ready. <laughs> so, um, just gonna remember that the kitchen diner, when it is camera ready, so, sort of camera ready, that it is a working place. It, it, it is actually active. It's not a showpiece, so it's not gonna be as pristine as if it were simply like like, like a, a studio kitchen. Studio kitchens are absolutely clean. They're immaculate. If a working kitchen is not immaculate. It's not pristine. It's a working kitchen. And so this is what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you a working kitchen, and then we're basically gonna go from there. Um. So we're going on to our, our master segments. We have two master segments today. Um, basically, uh, I'm going to do one segment, the main, the main master segment. It's going to be uh, what I've said it so far. I think the whole episode here, this episode, is going to be life at the research desk. I'm going to show you around the research desk, show you what I've done so far, uh, where I've started from, and then where I'm going. So. Uh, because this is a large part of my life here. The, the, the research desk is a major chunk of my life. So I think there does need to be an explanation of the research desk here and how I live here. So we're on to the new format now of, uh, new format now of segments and sub-segments. There is at least three segments coming uh, for the life at the research desk. And I may add a fourth one in. I'm not too sure. Or maybe we go on to another master segment. Anyways... I'll see you in the next segment. It's just a little after 2 o'clock in the morning on Monday, what is it? Uh, Monday, December 9th, 2013. That's our date, time and date stamp. And we will get on with this segment. This is a sub-segment to uh, life uh, at the research desk. And it's about, kind of, we're going to go into a little bit of the history of the research desk. Uh, and the bizarre things that actually occur when I'm at the research desk uh, <laughs> gets me into a situation where I don't really know what's going to end up happening near the end of it. And where I end up going is something completely different from where I expected to go when I first started. And this was sort of the case uh, when I started out uh, realizing what I wanted to do uh, with, in my second year of university, where I wanted to go uh, with my research. And I realized that in order to do what I wanted to do, I had to leave the University of Toronto. Was in, in my second year, I was an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto. And I decided that it came point in time for me that I was reading into what I wanted to do as I began sort of exploring the possibilities of what I was wanting to do, that uh, I would have to leave the University of Toronto, I'd have to leave the uh, standard education behind and kind of strike out on my own. And that was kind of the beginning of my research desk. That was about 1989, 1990, just around that point in time there. And uh, I took some money that I got from my grandmother for my birthday and incorporated, created uh, the company Delta R&D Inc. I had no idea uh, where it was going to take me, so I just simply gave it D for Daniel. Is uh, in Greek, that's Delta, and then R&D, Research and Development. No stretch of the imagination there. It was just sort of, let's give it a name, and let's sort of head on out the door as to uh, where I'm going. And I really didn't have any idea where I was going. I had read up to this point uh, in a book called um, um, I'll bring the book in a little bit. It's basically based on a book. Just give me a second here. 
I'm back. Sorry about that. I wanted to get the book that sort of started the whole thing. I actually, and this is a bizarre thing. I based my company off a book that I was reading. It's called uh, The Cosmic Code, uh, Quantum Physics as the uh, Language of Nature. And I had actually gone into uh, University of Toronto uh, aiming to become a quantum physicist, uh, doing uh, also uh, you know doing astrophysics. So I was in the astronomy and astronomy and physics program at UFT, uh, and the whole reason I got in there was because of this book, trying to sort of find my way through that I knew I wanted to do some form of exploration, but I didn't really know how to go about doing it. By the time I got into my second year of university, uh, things had got to the point where I kind of realized what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. That became Delta R and D, which was based on this book here, and I decided to base it off the off the random walk. Uh, the random walk is a part of uh, quantum physics, and it is what it, it what it sounds to be. It's just simply a random walk. And the thing is, is that the question was, where would a random walk in terms of open explore in terms of exploration and that's open exploration means uh, exploration that doesn't have any particular direction, so it's random, a random walk. Where does that take you? Where where will this, in terms of research, take me? And as I sort of began sort of asking that question, I realized that this was not something that you could do within the standard university. So I left the university and began to sort of uh, begin the random walk. I began, and my, that was my first research setup, my first sort of. Uh, my first research desk came out of the research desk that I had set up for university. It was in the corner of my bedroom. Uh, and I invested in three bookcases. And I proceeded to fill uh, those bookcases up. By the time 1995 had rolled around, I had moved uh, from my bedroom to the basement. I had expanded out of, the, out of the bedroom into the basement. And was proceeding to fill up the basement with uh, things. Part, bits and pieces of my research, the things I was exploring. And at this point in time, my mother basically had enough and said, well, it's time for you to leave, <laughs> like, you know, time for me to get out. Uh, and so that's what I did, is I eventually moved out of the house and um, into my first research unit. Uh, but the first research unit didn't last too long. Well, it just it, it, it's typical. It, it basically, every four to five years, things change for me. Uh, so the first uh, unit was um, just around the corner from here. It wasn't too far. It was maybe like 10 minutes with a, a 10 minute walk from here. And then from there, I moved into uh, the current place that I am now. So but the thing is, is that in the process of moving, in the process of doing this discovery, doing this research here, and the beginning part was basically, it, it, uh, this is uh, 1989, 1990, the internet was just beginning, there really wasn't much out there, so you actually had to go to do, you had to go do a lot of research at the library, and that's where I spent a large chunk of my time, is down at different libraries. Uh, and then I also went out to, um, part of the exploration was going to old bookstores, but if I couldn't afford new books, I went out to old bookstores and see, saw what I could bring. At that time, Discovery Channel hadn't come out yet, and so, uh, fortunately for me, there were still a lot of, uh, very good documentaries on, uh, PBS and TV Ontario. They had very good stuff. There was it was unbelievable what they've actually put out there. So I got myself. I invested in a uh, video editing system that allowed me to record uh, as much of the uh, much of the documentaries as I wanted to. And so I can go back over, take my notes, organize my notes, and uh, basically have this sort of that 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 beginning pieces of a research desk where you're starting to gather the information in together. It wasn't until I moved to my second research facility uh, on Hood Road. That's where I got the internet. That's where I started expanding and, and started opening my exploration into the internet uh, and trying to see where I could go from there. I realized uh, as I was doing this that where I wanted to go was eventually to have something like my something like because I was a Star Trek fan, I was watching uh, the Next Generation. Uh, I wanted to have my own Starship Enterprise. That was the goal. The goal was to have my own Starship Enterprise. 
But I really didn't know how about, you know, going and doing the how that would actually end up working out. It wasn't until I got into Hood Road that I began to realize that my research desk was the Starship Enterprise. That I could do the research from the desk, from the research desk, and then start putting feelers out, start exploring around and seeing what was out there. And, and, and then you could sort of make that leap. You could do the analogy of the Starship Enterprise right from within the research desk. And so that's what it was basically just around 2000, um, uh, right before 2000, right before the millennium, I left Hood Road, came to this address here, uh, which is at the corner of Victoria Park and Steeles. Uh, this is a general area. That's a, that's a huge industrial area here. Uh, so, uh, I'm in that basic area. I'm not too far from my parents. And this is where uh, the work uh, to build the Starship Enterprise be really began. This is the work where the work for on uh, cybernetics began. This is where a lot of the work in medicine began. Uh, it was sort of I had basically spent the 1990s doing my undergraduate work and my graduate work up to my PhD, doing all that the all the equipment notes, equivalent notes, the reading, the studying, uh, writing out different papers, and eventually trying to sort of stand up on my own as a PhD as a PhD and do the postdoctoral work, uh, basically inviting people to come in and criticize my work. That was basically from 2000 2004. Uh, and my uh, PhD basically was published to the internet. It, that's where it went out to. It went out to the internet. It went out to that public environment where let's see what I can do uh, on the internet as a research library in a research environment. And that became the basis for when I moved into uh, uh, Hood Road, the beginning of my research desk there. And so I'll take you around a little bit and I'm going to show you uh, the different rooms and then I'll come back here and we'll talk about different things, the, the different history of it. So we'll see you in the next segment. Stay tuned because I'm going to take you on a little trip. All right. All righty. Yep. It's time for the next segment of the BTS vlog. And before we get started, I'd just like to let you know that the BTS vlog is going to be this BTS vlog is going to be extended uh, till Tuesday. That's because well, basically Monday I took the day off and slept most of the day away. So let's get started with our time and date stamp, our vlog stamp. Because it wouldn't be a vlog without a time and date stamp. Uh, it's uh, twenty. No, it's uh, two hours and thirty-seven minutes into the day of Tuesday, December tenth. And so with our 10th day of Vlogmas, we're going into that 10th day of Vlogmas. And we will continue on with the life at the research desk because that's where I spend a, a large chunk of my time at the research desk. Just want to make sure a product that I'm working on over there is not uh, going to overflow and flood the place. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, on to uh, uh, the, uh, basically the brief history of the research desk here. Um... When I came came to this unit here, to this particular uh, facility, I, this was sort of where I had finished my P, I finished my PhD here, just at the, on the tip of it here, and began to realize that uh, that my Starship Enterprise was here, that, that that the research desk was that Starship Enterprise, and I began building up, working on the various components that would go in to make up a Starship Enterprise, and that included uh, uh, the Cybernetics Institute, which would eventually produce Cyborg Alpha. Uh, the Cybernetics Institute was a necessary part because if you're going to build uh, a Starship Enterprise, you can't build a Starship Enterprise without a data. You need to have data on board, and uh, data is a, a humanoid robot, supposedly uh, working on becoming sentient, becoming self-aware, uh, as they say, uh, and these arguments are still to be uh, made out there as uh, so what exactly constitutes a self-aware being, in other words, uh, an entity like a human being. Uh, how do we define ourselves in terms of being separate from all the separate from all the rest? What makes our mind, our thinking, different from the rest of the animals uh, 
in terms of how we see ourselves. Uh, and that's kind of uh, what the, the the core of cybernetics is. It's, it's looking at the human being as a model that you're going to use eventually at some point in time to build an android or a robot that is human-like. This is where you move from, ironically, as I was doing the research on this, you move from the mechanical aspects of the robot to the uh, it is mechanical but it's not necessarily mechanical it's more of a chemical aspects of the human robot if human beings are a robot you look at how human beings function and the mechanics of the human beings you'll find that they're, that they're a chemical being that they uh, well, at least appear to be a chemical being and that, that chemistry is organic chemistry. So that's how I moved into medicine from there. And that was sort of the beginning of the back room. That's the, the room I showed you back there. I'll give you a better tour of it later. Things are still really in flux here as I'm changing things out. Uh, and as I said, what happens is when you move from one facility to the next facility, there's a lot of... You can't shut things down with research. Research has to continue on. So, well... While you're working in one facility, you're setting up the next facility. Once the next facility has worked, you can kind of transfer your work from the one working facility back here to the new facility. And that's a process. It takes a couple months to do that, and there's a lot of stuff around. Things are moving back and forth. Uh, so it's never actually a clean place in terms of having things in a nice, neat set. set because as soon as you get to the new facility, as soon as you get your, into the, uh, the new um, uh, research uh, desk, you're now planning to move from that research desk to another research desk. And so that kind of, uh, you know, 2000 was where I set up the back room and my bedroom. That was where, where my primary research desk was. That was my first research desk was there. Uh, sort of beginning this aspect of things. And it stayed that way until about 2004, between 2004 and 2006. 2004, 2006, uh, the, li the library, the research began to expand, and I moved from the back room, in the bedroom, into the front room where I set things up and uh, began doing a large chunk of the research there. From 2004 to 2006, again, there was a flux. When I didn't immediately shut down the uh, back room as a research lab, I migrated from the back of the research lab, the back room research lab, where my bedroom was, to the front room. Uh, once I got to the front room and things were working well enough, then I took down the, uh, the, the research lab and began to repurpose the back room. In other words, uh, instead of just simply being for research, I decided I'd turn it into a reading room as well. So I'd go back there and I'd do, do my reading while I was back there. So uh, I had my front research desk. But when I wanted to sit back and relax, I wanted to do a lot of reading, particularly from uh, different books, I'd go to the back room and do my reading there. Uh, and it's basically in the back room, it, it, it's, in, it's that kind of sort of place where... Uh, uh, two years ago, I be actually began to do, um, uh, uh, what to call it, uh, Nerds RL. Do, no, do, uh, <laughs> do Big Bang Theory RL. Uh, what had it happened? I had moved everything to the front room, and things were going well in the front room, but I started growing out of the front room and started needing more space to do more of the research than the just in the front room. So I began to repurpose this room here. With this room, research room, this room here was primarily just storage. That's where I stored things, and I did some electronics here. Uh, and the back warehouse had gone from machine shop to uh, uh, the called upcycling place. It, I get a lot of my stuff from the garbage. That's where I do I do a lot of my refurbishing. I do a lot of the um, the furniture. A lot of do a lot of the repair work. Uh, and that's if you take stuff from the garbage, you're gonna have to do a lot of that. You have to need a place to do all that. So the warehouse became primarily uh, function for that. The back room was for sleeping and for reading. The front room became my research research desk. And in, in, in about 2004 to between 2004 and 2006. Then uh, as that time moved on, I started growing out of there. I started moving into here. Uh, with new technology, new upgrades to, to, to equipment. Uh, and this became my, uh, my uh, 
research desk, basically between 2010 and 2011. And then as this became my research thing, that became the back room, the front room became the editing desk, and along with the uh, the back room also became an editing desk as well. Both places is where I filmed. And I'm going to cut it off right now because our time is almost up, and I will continue on in the next segment. That kind of fixes it up there. Yeah, <laughs> we're back again uh, for the next segment. And we were talking about the uh, the fluctuation between uh, research desks, that as you go moving from one research desk to another research desk, and this is as it grows. And then each time you're moving, the research desk grows. It gets larger, and what you're doing by moving the desk is you're planning to add in capacity, and then once this capacity is reached, you then go back and move the. In other words, you keep moving as you add capacity. Uh, so once this capacity is reached, it starts working at its fullest at this re, at this current research desk. Well, at some point in time, I will begin working on the future research desk. That will have even more capacity. What we'll do is that this will stay operational until that time the new desk is is, uh, is functional. When the new desk is fun functional, uh, then this will be shut down, and the whole system here, all the systems here, will be upgraded. In other words, you upgrade now sections of the network, sections of the research desk, and the facility. Uh, as one, you have the funding for it, and then two, as you have the, the capacity to do that. Do you have have you used what you're currently using to its capacity? Once you've reached that capacity, then you have to start adding in larger, more capacity, and that sort of determines how fast and how quickly and, and, and how big your need next research desk needs to be. So this is going to give me an idea of what I can do here. This is sort of the beginning part of this research desk here. The uh, What's going to probably end up happening is that the other research desks uh, are going to uh, assume other functions now. In other words, instead of having one research desk that's always here, uh, I'm going to need something probably connected to uh, Cyborg Alpha Mu that will migrate with me to the other de desks and allow me to connect back and forth between all the different research desks. And what's sort of happening now is that the editing bay, the room where the editing bay is, where uh, the and this is why the front room became the editing bay, is that there's a lot there's a lot of VCRs hooked up together, and eventually that's going to be hooked up to the editing bay in a large chunk of the documentaries that I filmed from PBS, which are in the filing cabinet behind you. Uh, that's all going to be digitized and put onto the network. So as the network library grows, uh, a large chunk of the uh, stuff that have been, that have been done early on that's sort of still in the archives now, with all my archives, but not accessible because I don't have the VCRs uh, freely available all over the network. Uh, so I want something that will give me access, no matter where I am, to the videos. So. Uh, on, on Cyborg Alpha Mu, which is portable, I have access to everything on the network that's on the main uh, the main file server, the main uh, library hard drives. The library hard drive started off, basically started off with 500 gigabytes, now it's up to 6 terabytes. So it goes from 500 to 5,000 uh, gigabytes. That's uh, an increase of 10, it's a 10 time increase, times 10. Uh, it's, that's significant growth in that time from, my, from what I'm doing and consider, considering that uh, I'm private and, and that everything comes from private funding that level of growth is something I feel is pretty good and this is sort of what happens is that this is what I'm working on now and I'm talking about integrating different parts of the new research desk including the Cyborg Alpha Mu integrating it so that I can now start to manage that 6 terabyte library the 6,000 gigabyte library and this will lead you to a whole bunch of new avenues where you have to learn new things, you have to learn new um, skills. And it also brings you back to, and this is where I needed to, 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 to sort of to get, get to this point, is where uh, 
in with all the research that I do on a regular basis, on a daily basis, I have to now add in the vlogging and video production so that the shows go on on a regular basis. This is sort of what I'm talking about if you've been watching the last few vlogs. Uh, I am struggling to deal with scheduling in the video production for the shows that I want to produce here. And this is actually part of Cyborg Alpha TV. Is sort of seeing behind the scenes as I struggle to do this, as I struggle to sort of get a, uh, a handle on all this type of uh, scheduling work, uh, because we I do have a bit of spare time in here, but I got to find where that spare time is. In other words, what most people think is, uh, oh, I've been working all day. You have to go back and re-examine at what points in time of your day are you actually working, doing something, you know, significant, or in what times of the day are you distracted from what you're doing, in other words, your significant thing. Take that distracted time and then repurpose it so that you're doing something more significant. So, let's say on here I'm doing my, uh, I'm doing the research, I'm taking the notes. Is there a times where I'm distracted that I sort of goof off? that I can repurpose that and on another machine, with leaving the stuff here, leaving the stuff that I'm work, we're doing the research here, keep it going, is there a track point where maybe I can work over here? And that's exactly what I've done here, is I've got two androids here, so that as I need to do work that's, that can't be done on here, so I have to leave this that way it is, I can come over here to do uh, the Cyborg Alpha Mu, which is here, and only two-thirds of Cyborg Alpha Mu is here, uh, the the other third of Cyborg Alpha is back in the back room uh, where I do the filming for, for uh, Beauty and the Geek. Uh, it's back there. And it's there to bring together that entire back room with Cyborg Alpha Mute. And the same thing is going to happen eventually with the front room. There's going to be a Cyborg Alpha Mute that's going to go to the front room. It's going to stay in the front room uh, unless, I, unless I go out someplace. And it's going to tie together the entire front room in, ter in terms of the editing bay and bring that access uh, to here to the, to the editing desk. As well, if I'm at the editing desk and I need something from the research desk, Cyborg Alpha Mute will be the tie that will allow me to do the editing, keep the editing work in the editing bay and bring uh, the work th that I need to get done on the research desk uh, to my Cyborg Alpha Mute and that way I can get both bits of work done at the same time. In other words, I'm organizing my multitasking so that it's more effective, more efficient, and more work can be done. And this is actually how you start one by one resolving the scheduling problem, resolving uh, a number of the issues in terms of where your efficiencies are. And this all has to be done while you're repurposing the space. Because as you're doing this stuff and as you're doing the different designs and upgrading the different equipment, you also need to be upgrading the physical space as well. And so that, all that has to be dealt with as you're doing this. So this is sort of the what goes on, what happens behind the scenes here. Anyways, uh, that's it for now. Uh, I'm going to end this segment here. And I'll talk to you guys in a bit. It's uh, about 5.40 in the morning on, uh, let's see here, Thursday, Tuesday, December 10th, 2013. And I'm just sort of watching, uh, trying to catch up with my Gen X pen. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, her, her channel. I've seen it for, from, from um, when I first got on to YouTube and started doing my YouTube scroll. That's where I kind of uh, saw her. But anyways, um, that being said, I'm going to keep this short because this is the last segment of the vlog. This is the ending segment of the, of the BTS vlog for uh, basically the weekend. Uh, and as I said, we included Monday in this because basically I slept all day Monday. Uh, I'm waiting for new equipment to come in. So we'll see how this goes up. I also have to do some editing on this because I kind of went over my time, time limit. Uh, it's going to take me a while uh, to sort of get the... Uh, filming and segments downright uh, but uh, that's kind of how things go <laughs> anyways I'll see you in a few hours uh, for the next BTS vlog all right goodbye
am the professor. And professor of what? Professor of physics. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light? Free speech rules here at Democratic Earth.